Okay, good morning again. We're going to try it again. Hopefully this time we've got everything working well. Welcome to our morning walk with the Apostles for Wednesday, March the 9th. Excuse me, March the 10th. Certainly good to be with you this morning. Uh, there we go. Everything seems to be working now. And uh, apologize for that little bit of a delay in getting started this morning. Let's begin this morning with prayer, and then we're going to move into a new chapter in, in Acts, chapter uh, 12. So uh, let's begin with prayer. Father, thank you for the day and its blessings. It's a beautiful day, and we just are so grateful to see the, the days warming and the springtime coming. Uh, we thank you, Father, for all you do for us in our, in our lives, and we pray, Father, uh, right now here in Hereford and Death Smith County and in fact the whole panhandle of Texas and uh, eastern New Mexico, the Oklahoma panhandle, we're all under a fire weather alert and uh, watch and just pray Father that there not be no, no devastating deadly fires today. Uh, just We need rain so bad Father and we just pray that you'll send it and soon. Be with us in our study this morning as we talk about uh, Peter's arrest and deliverance. And uh, while we're looking at the facts of this, help us, Father, to remember that there are lessons here to learn about uh, faithfulness to you, about prayer, and so many other things, Father, that, uh, that will in be strengthening to us and to our faith. We thank you for the Christ, and we pray in his name. Amen. Well, let me start this way with uh, our devotional talk this morning. Through the years, I've heard Christians say with despair uh, in their voices, I don't know what else to do. I've done everything I know to do. Well, let me tell you a story that I read one time about a small boy who was working with his father in the yard. The boy decided that he would move a large stone that was an obstacle that needed to be moved. The father watched his son struggle with the rock, but it would not budge. Finally, the man asked his little boy, are you using all your strength? Yes, Daddy, he said, panting. I'm using all my strength. No, you're not, the father replied. You're not using all your strength because you have not asked me to help. When you and I struggle with obstacles, to remove obstacles in our lives, sometimes we think we have done everything we can when we have failed to ask our Heavenly Father for help. The Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 4, verse 5b through 7, The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When you have done all you know to do. Turn the matter over to God. Now our devotional this morning is on the importance and power of prayer in reality. There are many Bible uh, events, uh, rec stories that illustrate the value of prayer such as Solomon's prayer for wisdom in the Old Testament, Elijah and his prayer about the three and a half years of drought and the prolonging of Hezekiah's life. 
But none are more striking than the story of Peter's deliverance from prison in our text this morning as we begin looking at Acts chapter 12. Chapter 12 begins, Now about that time, verse 1a. That time refers to the end of the previous chapter when the Antioch disciples determined to send help to the Christians in Jerusalem and in Judea. About the same time, going back to chapter 12, verse 1, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. Now since Herod Agrippa I died in A.D. 44, his persecution of the church in Jerusalem must have occurred in late 43 or early 44. If the Antioch contribution was about the time, the disciples in Antioch sent the contribution before the famine came. Since the, con the conversion of Saul, the church in Jerusalem had enjoyed a, per a period of peace. See chapter 9 verse 31. But now, that peace is shattered. This is the fourth persecution of the church recorded in Acts. It differs from the first three in that it was instigated not by the Sanhedrin, but by a representative of the Roman government, King Herod. Now, this was Herod Agrippa I grandson of Herod the Great, who had ordered the babies to be killed when Jesus was born. At the time of the events here in chapter 12, this Herod, Agrippa I, ruled over all Palestine. Now, like all <clears throat> Rome-appointed rulers of Palestine, Herod had a palace at Caesarea, and he normally came to Jerusalem only for the feast days. In Acts chapter 12, he had apparently come to Jerusalem in anticipation of the feast of the Passover. At that time, he instigated a persecution of the church to win the approval of his subjects. The church had enjoyed the support of the citizens of Jerusalem at, in the beginning, Acts 2.47. But that had changed. The preaching of Stephen had turned the people against the church. See chapter 6, verse 12. And the recent acceptance of Gentiles had perhaps intensified that he, hatred. Now, as a public relations move, Herod decided to torment the followers of Jesus. Now there's another detail that sets this persecution apart. Originally, the council had arrested the apostles, but they had not been successful in keeping them in jail or keeping them quiet. Subsequent persecution had focused on, quote, ordinary members of the church instead of the twelve. Chapter 8, verse 1. Herod, once again, concentrated on the apostles, those seemingly invulnerable leaders. No doubt all were surprised, inside the church and out, when for the first time since, uh, for, when for the first time someone was successful in killing one of the twelve. Herod's uncle, Herod Antipas, had given the order for John the Baptist to have his head cut off, and Herod Agrippa I adopted the same tactic. Verse 2 here says, And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. Now Luke's 
restraint in recording this startling event is incredible. He used only seven words in the original text to tell of the first execution of an apostle. The James who was killed was part of Jesus' privileged inner circle, the brother of John. His death had been foretold by Jesus when the mother of James and John, thinking of a political kingdom, had requested that her sons be given positions of authority on Jesus' right hand and left. Jesus had been astonished. And he told James and John, you do not know what you're asking for. And then he asked, are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? Matthew 20, verse 22. Jesus was speaking of the cup of suffering that awaited him. James and John glibly replied, we are able. Then Jesus said sadly, my cup you shall drink. Matthew 20, 22 and 23. Perhaps those words came to James' mind as he laid his neck upon the chopping block. He must have thought something like, I didn't know what I was asking for, did I? Incidentally, we find no indication that a replacement for James was selected after he died. The New Testament does not teach apostolic succession. One other point here. Luke's restraint is proof of his writing by inspiration. God does not write as man writes. Man writes to satisfy the curiosity God writes only what, uh, only that which is needed to save the soul. Well, the response of the people to uh, the decapitation of James was everything Herod could have hoped for. Verse 3a says that, when he saw that it pleased the Jews. That's chapter 12, verse 3a. He decided that if killing the number three apostle had made them happy, killing the number one apostle would really make his subjects loyal for life. So verse 3b and 4a say, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him. Now, while telling of Peter's arrest, Luke adds an editorial note in verse 3c here in chapter 12. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread. The days of unleavened bread referred to the week-long Feast of Unleavened Bread climaxed by the Feast of Passover. By New Testament times, these two feasts had been blended together and were simply called Passover. Luke may have been informing his readers why Herod was in Jerusalem. As noted earlier, the Roman governors came from Caesarea to Jerusalem for special feasts like the Passover. And Luke may also have been hinting that Herod, flamboyant showman that he was, chose a time when he would have the biggest audience. Jerusalem was flooded with Jews during Passover week. However, initiating a persecution around feast time posed a problem for Herod. The arrest quote, trial, end quote, and execution of James had gone smoothly. It had probably been a hasty affair immediately preceding the feast. By the time Peter was arrested, feast time was upon them. A public execution would be offensive to the Jews during uh, this sacred week, Mark 14, verse 2. 
This was only a minor setback for Herod, and he could use it to his advantage. Anticipation would build all week long. Then, after the Passover, he would bring him out before the people. Acts 12, 4b. No doubt, Herod planned for Peter the same fate as that of James, if you look down to verse 11 in chapter 12. During the seven days of the feast, Herod took no chances on having Peter escape. He turned the Roman jail in Jerusalem into a maximum security prison. Now, normally, a political prisoner would simply be placed in prison. Peter was placed in the inner prison with three locked doors between himself and freedom. Verse 10. Usually, no special guards were assigned to a political prisoner, or if any were assigned, only one at a time guarded the prisoner. When Herod seized Peter, he put him in prison, de delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him. Verse 4a. Now, the Greek word translated squads refers to a squad of four soldiers. So you've got four groups of four, 16 soldiers were assigned to guard Peter. Now, each squad of four was responsible for a three-hour shift, so there would be four at a time. Further, in extreme cases, one soldier would be chained to a prisoner at night. But according to Luke, each evening Peter was handcuffed to two soldiers, one on each side. A third soldier in the squad stood guard outside the prison door, while a fourth stood guard between the inner cell and the outer gate. Verse 10. All of this was in addition to normal prison security. From, from a human perspective, I would imagine it seemed impossible for Peter to escape. <laughs> Can't you just imagine Herod smirking at the Sanhedrin council and saying, <laughs> I hear you had a hard time keeping Peter in prison. Let me show you how it's done. We'll take a long look at the mourners standing beside the grave of James and then contemplate Peter in prison. Underline these thoughts in your mind. Christians have problems. In this life, evil often seems to triumph. And we must face these realities. They existed in the first century. They exist today in the 21st. However, glance back over the text and note that we have surveyed only a few verses of, verse, of chapter 12. This story is not complete. The plot of a novel is not exhausted in the first few pages. You must continue to the last page to find out how the story ends. Your situation may seem as impossible as Peter's, but folks, God has not had the last word. When trials and temptations come into your life, take the long view. Trust in the Lord. Well, tomorrow, we're going to keep looking at this event and see what happened. Did Peter stay in prison or not? 
Oh, I'm sure you know, but let's look at it tomorrow and see. Let's bow together in prayer as we close. Father, thank you for this event that we read about with James being beheaded and with Peter being arrested and put in prison. Father, we thank you for the lessons that are here for us, the lesson with regard to prayer that we'll see as the, the disciples prayed for Peter, and as a result, he was delivered by your angel. Father, may we learn from those lessons as we continue to look at that, uh, this event tomorrow and Friday. Just help us, Father, to to realize that while you may not, you not, you're not going to send an angel to deliver us like Peter was delivered, but you do deliver us. And even if our circumstances turn out as those did for James, and we lose our life, it's far better as we go home to be with you. Father, I continue to pray for those in need of our prayers, those sick, those lost lost loved ones having surgeries and father just be with them and help us to do what we can and father be with our nation as we seek to trust you and know that you have the last word we pray this in the name of jesus amen well you go out make your wednesday a great one lord willing we'll be back here tomorrow for again for a morning walk with the apostles.